Yo, these capitalists, it's so wild when they don't want it to be capitalism anymore. That's right. That's right. And and it goes back to something else, which is how many times do we tell sports fans, they're not all us about winning. They're all these owners. Teams aren't trying. Very few teams are trying to win. Like number one priority is winning. No, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. It is that time of week where we have a guest join us, coming to us live from uh, Metal Arc Media, ESPN, a lot of books. Howard Bryant, what's going on? Hey, yo, good morning. Hey, man. Uh, baseball <laughs> is all over the news right now in the best way that baseball <laughs> can make the news, which is by not playing baseball. Here's my question for you. Can you think of a time when baseball made the news when it wasn't messing up? <laughs> like, I'm for real. I mean, Otani, we was trying to make Otani, that thing okay, crack. Okay. But generally speaking, it's steroids, it's biogenesis, it's this. It's, I mean, it's always something with this sport. It's labor, and now we got no games. And Yo, go ahead. I was say, the thing about labor is. For the last 27 years, because the last work stoppage was such an embarrassment for all parties involved, there was like a collective resolve. We're not going to do that again. But for people our age and older, this is what it this was what, for 25 years. We going to fight been, on everything and the everything. players won every time. Well, that's right. And I think that the other piece of this is that if you know your baseball history, it depends. Once again, and I'm not I'm not hating on the youngins because their history is different from our history. They know where it it, it didn't stop, right? They after after 1995, they didn't do this again. Had a had a, a a little blip in 2002, but they stopped it at the 11th hour. These guys have been at each other's throats for 60 years. They've been at each other's throats since forever. It's like these two teams do not get along. They don't get along. And I think the biggest difference with baseball and in the other sports the NBA does it best where they absolutely recognize that there's a partnership involved here, right? They understand that you have to get along with your players. I don't think baseball sees the players as partners, and they never have. And I think that beating the union and crushing the union, they have been going after the same issues for my entire lifetime. And I think that when after the 2005 during the during the steroid hearings in March, uh, March 17th, 2005, there was this argument that what you really need is new leadership. Well, now you have new leadership. And what did baseball do when Tony Clark took over? They saw a chance to break these dudes once and for all. They underestimated Tony. They thought he was in over his head. They thought he was weak. They thought the players weren't that the players weren't unified. That in the last negotiation, when the players were looking for creature comforts instead of really fighting on the monetary issues, they were laughing at the players. They've been laughing at the players for five years. In fact, they were laughing at them so hard that there was a an unofficial edict that went through Major League Baseball to be very conciliatory to the players and not gloat after crushing them in the last negotiation. And now this new group, the last couple years, Tony Clark, Dave Winfield, Bobby Bonilla, Rick Helling, Javi Vasquez, the new leadership um, at the union for the last two and a half years have been going camp to camp to camp to get these guys ready for this moment. And they, you, they're competitors, they're professional athletes. Are you really going to inflame a professional athlete? Competition is, is, is their MO, and now they're in fight mode. So I've always had this feeling with baseball labor that inadvertently, if there's any lasting benefit that the owners got out of the steroid era, it is not just simply the money and the gate and everything else that they got in that way, is that they found a legitimate fissure in the labor force, right? Like they found somewhere where they could exert some pressure and there'd be some measure of split because part of why the steroid thing got out of control is that the baseball players have been so powerful to be like, you ain't getting no blood from us, period. <laughs> no tested, that's Do right. Right. Doesn't matter what you want it for or how it goes. You're not getting that from us. And the owners couldn't do anything about it. But then it wound up making everybody look so bad. And the owners were able to put it all off on cheating players and say, hey, we would have done this except for the union. And then you have the guys who were cheating versus the ones who weren't and the ones who weren't who felt like their careers were being affected at, you know, adversely by this. 
And that was their first cause for legitimate split. And I felt like yeah. really put the players on a measure of defensive because they were the ones that took the blame for what at the time was seen as like the greatest shame of baseball. But that's kind of worn off now. And then they looked up and realized, and this is so wild to me, the last four years, payroll across Major League Baseball has gone down. As the revenues have gone up. That's, that's a Marlins are a $2 billion franchise. The Marlins? And so how are you going to make an argument that you broke when the Marlins are going for $2 billion? And so these are the areas where if you're the players, you're like, no, 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 no. Our middle class has been declining for years, right? That the players, the owners right now have made the calculation. And that there's a new peop there's a, there's a new group of people who are running this game. It's not the old group anymore. It's not the old guard. You've got these Wall Street analytic dudes who are looking at the numbers, and they're not paying you anymore for what you did. So when you hit free agency at 30, they're not going to be like, yeah, well, you put your time in, in, and part of this contract is from your accomplishments. They're looking at, here's what you're going to do going forward. So in 1975... You have Peter Seitz, the, the Seitz decision blows up the reserve clause. You get free agency. And they kick it back to the owners and the players and say, okay, you guys figure it out. The owner's first proposal when a player could become a free agent was 10 years. Right? 10 years. The average, the average career is three and a half years. You couldn't become a free agent for 10. Players wanted three. They negotiated and compromised at six. It's been six years since 1975. It's been a stone tablet, right? But now that you have this new group of, of ownership and, and general managers coming in, the players are like, well, wait a minute. Six years is too long now because you guys are manipulating service time. So instead of bringing me up when I'm major league ready, you're holding me back in the minors. So you're stealing another year of control from me. So now instead of being able to be a free agent at six years, now it's seven years. Now I'm 29, 30 years old. And now you're telling me I'm too old. So I'm not ever going to get my payday. So instead of trying to crush free agency through labor, now they're doing it through service manipulation. And the players are like, no, 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 forget that. We need to go down to five years. So I get to be a free agent at five years. The owner said no. So the owners are essentially saying no to everything that is remotely going to balance the fact that this new group of people who are running the game are manipulating the game. They're manipulating how this sport is being run right now. And there's no give on that. And you're... the. The idea that the new is a bit more uh, repressive than the old <laughs> is pretty staggering That's when you stop and it? think about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. Like, and let, me tell, let me tell you one thing I find interesting about this. I'm curious what you think here. I feel like what's happening with baseball, and there are more parts to it that I'm going to get to, but one thing I want to start with right here is this is like a great argument for your Bernie Sanders-esque it's not about race, it's about class arguments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because this is, outside of hockey, obviously, but this is a wider labor force than you have in basketball. This is a wider labor force than you have in baseball. In baseball, I mean, excuse me, in, ba in football. And, like, we've seen basketball, the walk back that's taken place on, for example, revenue sharing. Go look at the share of the revenue the players were getting 30 years ago and go look at what it is now. They basically walked it back at every negotiation. Football, mm -hmm. we've seen where the guys have been able to extract some gains, but even still, we see the way when it comes down to it, them cats always go in. And I think that part of that is black folks are a bit more likely to be like, hey, man, it's just kind of what it is. We got to get the best we can and make what we can out of it and then go. Them white dudes playing baseball is white dudes. You yeah. ain't about to be out here telling them what they got to put up with when they fundamentally believe it's unfair. They exactly. gonna go to the wall about that because well, the game's that, supposed to play different for them, and thereby it does. Well, that's right. And then the other thing about that too, which is where they actually had a split, where to that point, the owners felt it maybe was in their favor because it is true. Baseball is a white suburban sport that is reinforced by foreign labor, right? That's what the game is now. I mean, the black percentage of the game is seven and a half percent. So you've got the Asian players that you pay a whole bunch for to bring them over and you got to pay their teams and the whole thing. So they're big money signings. Then you've got this entire force of Latino players that you're completely exploiting and you've been exploiting since the 1960s. And those players is that's the player group where the owners felt like they had the most traction in terms of breaking the union because those guys are absolutely happy that the qualifying offer is just a mere 19 million. 
right? They're like, I'm, I'm cool with that, right? They're not, you know, they, they're not invested in the um, American push pull tug of war of labor. They're like, damn, minimum salary, 600,000. I was stitching basketballs in a Dominican. I, I'm not going to fight this, but Tony and company have done an amazing job getting those guys. And here's what we fight for. Here's why we're fighting the education that those guys have have uh, they've really undergone a, a serious education campaign over the last few years because they were concerned about that. That as the Latino numbers grew, they weren't going to fight this American fight. It wasn't their fight. And so I, I think that the other piece of this bow that I find fascinating is that it's not just the money. Normally, you know, the millionaires fighting the billionaires, it's a lazy, stupid argument. And that's something that people can sort of accept because it's just labor. But I think what's taking place in baseball right now is also a fundamental change in how this game is played. Right? That it's not just the money. It's how do, what do you want your game to look like? OK, and the one thing that the players are doing here that they're not doing necessarily as much in other sports is that these players don't want to see tanking. You know, we talk about this in college basketball a lot. The guy who goes to Duke loses five games in four years and now is on the Clippers and loses 60 games. You know how what it does emotionally to go out on a baseball season and lose 100 games? You're getting whooped every day. And the combination of watching teams tank and the fact that you've gone 100% in on gambling, the players are like, we don't want this. This is not what we want our game to look like. But ownership has not really shown a lot of respect on that. And I think that the big thing, you want to talk about a galvanizing moment? When the commissioner of baseball referred to the World Series trophy as a piece of metal. That one sentence... Tony Clark is looking at his guys going, see, this is what I'm talking about. And it was a galvanizing moment for them, and it brought them all together, and they understand the common fight now. Let me tell you, I, like, I think it's interesting when we talk about Tony Clark in line with that. He got here looking like Harry Edwards, right? He's 6'8", mm -hmm. bald head with the big yep. old gray beard and the shades and everything else. But as much as they didn't like Donald Fear, they recognized that Donald Fear, in effect, was one of them. Well, you had to respect Donald as well. Right. But he's also, he's also a white man of the professional class, right? That's right? Like, they are dealing with what they believe to be a worthy adversary, even They don't if respect they, Tony Clark. That's the thing. They don't respect the black dude in charge. And they were like, oh, okay, cool. We got this. And had reason to believe for a stretch. Okay, cool. You're right. Now we got this. But in the end, I have to give him all the credit in the world for galvanizing that labor force to get behind him in the ways that they seem to have in this one because the players don't seem like they're backing down. And baseball players, unlike basketball and football, I can't say this about hockey because they've done it a couple times in my lifetime, they will walk away from a lot of checks. Baseball does not break. If there's one thing, because the stars run the show, right? I mean, let's go back. Go back to 87. I remember the last conversation I had with Gene Upshaw before he died. I remember exactly we were sitting there in, Re in Redskins Park, back when it was Redskins Park. And he was talking about the 87 strike. And he said, this was the one, once and for all, where I said, we're going after this. Because they, football was tired of, of everybody comparing them to baseball. How come baseball sticks together and you guys can't? So he said, I ran up that hill and I looked behind me and there was nobody there. 30% of base of football players crossed the line in 87 in the first month. Joe Montana crossed the line. Lawrence Taylor crossed the line. Mark Gaston, how do you, you can't win that way, right? Baseball players, it's Dave Winfield. It's Reggie Jackson. It's Joe Torrey. It's Tommy Glavin. It's David Cohn. The top guys are like, mm -mm. we stick together. And that was the area where baseball, where it was really fractured, where it was like, okay, does this group, especially to your point at the beginning of this conversation, does this group, which hadn't had to go through it, do y'all stick together when the money's bigger than ever? Even though it's less than it should be, it's more than ever. And you haven't done one of these. Everybody else had to do one, right? I mean, Winfield, well, Winfield went through what, five of them? And during his time, George Brett went through how many of them? Ricky went through how many of them? But this group, this is the first time that they've really had to go through it. And, and it is true. 
you know, you're looking at somebody and you know those conversations are taking place. Are you guys really fighting over $14 million? But that's really not the fight. The fight is when you look at the numbers. Baseball players, they're not, it's not millionaires versus billionaires. The, there are a lot of players in baseball who are getting squeezed out of the game. Now, they're making more than us, but we're not comparing ourselves to them. And by the way, the way media is going right now, there's a lot of people at the top of broadcasting making more than the players. And by the way, we also got a lot of players. We got to remember where that salary is bankrolling a whole lot of people. It's like, bankrolling it's not the whole families. Simply, That's right. Right. It's not simply um, about them. But where I find this baseball labor situation so interesting and a big part about why I wanted to talk about it with you is... According to the latest research, 90% of employers plan to make enhancing the employee experience a top priority in 2022. After all, a happy workplace is key to attracting and keeping great employees, such as allowing for more flexibility in work schedules. And if you need to add more employees to your team, there's ZipRecruiter. Their matching technology helps you find the right people for your roles fast. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Then, it proactively presents these candidates to you. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. based on G2 rating. Find the right employees for your workplace with ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-O-M-A-N-I. As you put it, the millionaires versus billionaires, that's the framing that you wind up with whenever you have these labor disputes. Not understanding millionaires just doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means like mi right. millionaire is a figure of speech like what you hear when you hear the word millionaire is based on a valuation of the dollar that doesn't exist anymore we've been using the term millionaire for a long time it doesn't mean what it did in 1950 right not That's to right. say that having a million dollars now isn't a lot of money but it is not this it's not quite the rarefied air that you talk about now some of these guys of course have tens of millions so i'm not pretending like they're broke but, but millionaire yeah, they, they can't <laughs> they can't get in the room with what the owners were before, you know, what the owners are now. They can't do that. That's not even an option. But what's happening with this baseball work stoppage, when you look at it, is a legitimate microcosm of what's happening across American labor. And I've been shocked right. that I haven't really seen people make that extension. The people at top, I did in yesterday's call. Yeah, right. But the <laughs> owners are making more money than ever. And right. somehow what they're paying the players is actually going down. And that's, that's happening right. at just about every corporation that you can find in this country. The money keeps getting way, way, way bigger at the top. And the people earning money, people working there, are making less and less. And so what you have overall in America is a shrinking of the middle class that's been going on for a really long time. Like when I was uh, going to graduate school, I went to North Carolina for a PhD program. And the reason I went was I read a book by Professor Sandy Darity that was called Persistent Disparity. He and uh, Sam Myers, who at the time was working at um, Minnesota. But the point that they made was that black people were getting squeezed in the economy. But the rationale was less about something directly attributed toward black people than a general squeezing of the middle class, That's which right. was going to affect black people disproportionately, but it was affecting everybody. That's and so, right. so much of what you see that's going on right now in the news as it relates to the economy and how COVID has affected this and all this is about this squeezing of the middle class and baseball is having it happen. And so, yeah, it does, it's obviously people making a different level of money, but their fight actually is the fight that everybody else is having. The right dynamic now. is the same. 100% right. 100% right. And, and what they're banking on, they being the owners, is this very lazy argument that those guys make a ton of money. That's, that is the baseline. They make a ton of money to play a game, which, by the way, shows the complete lack of professional respect that most people have for them. Oh, I was watching the game last night. Oh, I can't believe he dropped that ball. I could have made that play. No, you couldn't have. No, you couldn't have. You can't do what they do. They are geniuses at what they do. They are at the very, very top of what they do. 
under the most amount of pressure because unlike the rest of us, you have a bad show. Somebody ain't taking your job tomorrow. Those guys lose their job the very next day, especially in the NFL. You miss a you miss a kick, you're out of a job on Monday. They cut the kicker, gone, for career over, maybe. So, one hundred percent. And I think that this is this is the argument that this is what Tony has been selling to the players. He's been telling them, look at it's it's the same thing as what Marvin used to do, what Marvin Miller used to do. Don't listen to me. Look at what's happening. You don't have to believe me. Look at what's happening. And with your own two eyes, you'll see. And and you're right. One of the things about Tony that is really important is that traditionally white people in that sport particularly, very conservative sport, they're not used to taking orders from somebody black anyway. And so for Tony to really reach across and find a way to meet people and to get them to understand all of us are in this right now. It's not just the message, it's also the messenger. And that was sort of the strategy of, hey, I'm an ex-player. And you're right, the, the ownership didn't respect Tony because they'd never had to deal with an ex-player before. Tony's the first ex-player to run that union. And so the fact that we're at this point is a byproduct of two things. One, the education campaign that Tony had to engineer. But two, you're 100% right, Bo, that ownership has decided that this was the moment where we can have everything. Don't need to hit him with that class argument, man. Like, Well, and here's the other thing, right? I was going to say, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but here's the other thing too. It's also that the players, they're saying, hey, look at the game you're playing right now. Like, look at how it's being played. Like, there's an assembly line level to baseball that you don't see in the other sports right now. I know analytics have taken over all the sports, and I know that when you watch basketball, every trip down court is to either get a dunk or a corner three. They're the highest percentage shots. I get all the E-field goal percentages and all the analytics and all that other stuff. However, in baseball, baseball, especially when it comes to pitching, they're not even talking about competition anymore. Yeah. You guys got openers and guys don't have to go five innings and the pitcher is like, well, wait a minute. No, no, I'm here to compete. You're here to get outs. Okay, I'm here to get 27 outs no matter how I get them. But the starting pitcher is like, I'm here to win. You know, I mean, that they are two totally different attitudes in terms of obviously reaching the same goal. But if I'm a starting pitcher, you mean taking me out of a game in the fourth inning? I'm here to win games. I'm here to compete against the other team. And that's not how the game is being run right now. No, the tanking thing, and you mentioned it, man. I just can't imagine the misery of being around 162 games of we stink. 100 times you're going to beat. And by the way, with no clock, I don't even know what time <laughs> we going home. This ass whooping could take four, five hours for well, all I know. Jo that's what Joe Torre used to say. We used to say to him after an extra inning game when I was covering the Yankees, Hey, Joe, you know, it was in the 14th. Weren't you just like, okay, I don't care who wins. And Joe's like, no, if I've been here since 7 o'clock, we better walk out of here with a W. No, nah, but the thing I always hear people with when they don't understand, like in baseball, like why you're not supposed to be stealing bases when you're up a certain number of runs? Because we trying to go home. <laughs> we just trying to get up out of here, man. I've been here since 1 o'clock this afternoon. That's right. That's right. And you up 7 nothing, stealing third base with nobody out? Yeah, like, come on, man. Like, I'm, I'm looking out for you. Look, y'all got this one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a wrap. We can just get out of here. You, you don't want to go take a shower. I'm funky as hell right now. Right, and look at it this way, too, in terms of how the game is being played, right? Now, the argument had been baseball is too old. And also, let's just take a step back. 1958. Jackie Robinson does an interview essentially saying that baseball is boring as hell to watch. Great to play but boring as hell to watch. 1956, Sporting News does an editorial talking about how the game has taken too long because the average time of game was two hours and one minute, right? So this argument in baseball has been going on for half a century. It's always too long. It's always too slow. It's always going to be too boring. However, what baseball is going through right now, so let's go and mess with the playoffs and that there's a the proposal is on the table, to add baseball to 14 teams for the postseason. 14? How are you gonna have 14 playoff teams in a postseason and still play 162? It's too long. But the owners will not give up a single home date, so they won't bring the season back. 
right? Because they don't want to lose that much money. But they want to make money because you make money in the postseason, so let's expand the playoffs. I just grabbed a random year, Bo. You take 2016, for example. 2016, under today's proposed um, schedule, you got two teams with 78 wins making the playoffs. Ain't no way you can... That is unsustainable. Why would you play 45 spring training games or 35 spring training games, 162 baseball games, for a 79-win team to make the playoffs. That could mess around and win the that World Series. That could win series. the whole thing. And why is that? Why is that different than the rest of them? Because in baseball, unlike any other sport, you don't run your best team out there every day. Because if your best player is Pedro Martinez, he's essentially playing 20% of your games. So you have to have the best teams in the postseason. Otherwise, you're going to run into some dude. You're going to run into an Earl Hershiser on a 78-win team who ends up getting hot and wins the World Series. Yep, like you delegitimize. It, I think my buddy Andy Glockner said it. Baseball has a random championship generator. Like once they went and they expanded that, when the 82-win St. Louis Cardinals won it in, in 2006, it was just yeah. like, oh, anybody can get this anybody. once you open it up. It's kind of like hockey has that same, like the hot goalie thing comes well, up in hockey. Well, it's a very well, similar situation. Well, but that's just a natural byproduct of the game. That's not a manipulation of rules. Hockey's just fluky. Sometimes, you know, Dominic Hasek is standing on his head. You can't, you can't get it past him. Yeah, and see, I think baseball's like that to a degree, too. Like, it's a bit more about ebb and flow. Like, they're not all going to be like basketball where the best team is going to win the championship by and large. It's very, very rare that the team that ultimately wins is not the best team. Football, by nature of being a single el elimination tournament, has something a little different. But with oh, yeah. baseball you and hockey, you can have seven-game series and... You the one who like you are winning a tournament when you That's win right. the postseason that they put together, as opposed to I am sure this is the best team there was. No, hundred percent, hundred percent, and and baseball is not a best player wins sport. Even though when you run it across history, it's not that different than the other sports, because when you think about all the great players, with the very few exceptions, all of them end up playing for a championship. I mean, that's how talented they are. I mean, that's why we can name on one hand the Ernie Bankses of the world. And, you know, everybody plays for a championship. Many of them win. But even, you know, Charles Barkley played for a championship. Patrick Ewing played for a championship. The best players do rise to the top. But you're 100% right that when you get that fluky and the nature of that sport, the best players have the best teams have to compete. And also, it's it's also the the other piece of this that gets to me is why won't you give up anything? I mean, you're an outdoor sport. At some point, you're gonna be playing in December, right? I mean, at some point, don't you have to deal with the realities of your calendar? Oh or man, gonna... they, don't care. they don't care about that calendar. I was thinking about that now. <laughs> when they talk about they go cancel games. I'm like, they're gonna be out there playing baseball with Kwanzaa patches on if they got to. <laughs> Please believe well, that. They well, won't play no games on no Sundays because they know nobody will watch them, but they'll be out here playing in the bitterest cold, the bitterest cold. They will they will try to figure out how to reconfigure that stadium in Minnesota that they got for football in order to go out there and play if they got to. Well, and, and that's, that's the Scott Boris argument from years ago, which was neutral site, World Series, everybody just play in Arizona. And I'm like, you're doing that so you can expand the season. But <laughs> at, at some point... Who cares if you can be a, a, a seven seed making the playoffs? Why am I watching this game in August? Who cares? I mean, doesn't it have? I mean, the reason why they do this in the, the reason why they have this one game wild card, ostensibly, which I never liked, was to give the regular season meaning that you don't deserve a playoff series if you don't come in first place so you have to play a play-in tournament as a way to make the season mean something so you're not going to be a playoff team and just blow september because you're already in you have to keep playing otherwise you got to play this poison game which could knock you out in an afternoon i didn't like that but i understood that rationale what can the rationale be now if you're going to have 14 teams it's half the league making the playoffs the same basketball you know i mean remember when i was a kid when you were when we were kids, man, the NBA had twenty three teams and sixteen of them made the playoffs. Yes, Ho hockey had twenty one teams and sixteen of them made the playoffs. You can't do that in baseball. Well, the other thing is, if you ever rooted for a seventy eight win team, the last thing you want them to do is play another game. <laughs> I don't want to watch them no more.
You know what I'm but saying? It, like, you know that happens sometimes with a college football team where it all goes so bad and then it's like, yo, we ain't even going to the bowl. Yeah, I know. We six and six. We nah, we're not even gonna do that, man. We just gonna stay at the crib. Go get them next year. Yeah, nobody wants right. to see them play again. Exactly. You know, but the you know, the rent a car bowl is calling now. We ain't taking <laughs> that call. Right. But here's the other piece of that too, right? What does it do? It kills in some way free agency. It kills player movement. Because if you're just hanging out around 500 and you can still make the playoffs and get into that tournament crapshoot, why would you make a deal? Why would you trade for anybody? Why would you unload people? Why would you try to get better? Right? I mean, all of these different things come into play in terms of the ecosystem of making deals and of economy. And also, if you're not going to change that ceiling, right? There's a great question here. And as, as an economist, you would appreciate this. Why do we call this a competitive balance tax? Why is keeping the Red Sox from spending $250 million on payroll? What does that do for the Baltimore Orioles? Why does that make them more competitive? Oh, yeah, no, nah, it's amazing. Uh, the variability in the views of <laughs> capitalism and how right? it is applied when it gets to a certain level. Because see, this is what I think is interesting about that. Because maybe even if I understood that idea, right? The New York Yankees won four championships in five years from 1996 through the year 2000. But that's not when the spending really started, right? Like that, those four, those five years, the basis of that was homegrown, right? Like you get Roger Clemens in at the end of it, like in 99. Oh, you mean their even, spending? Yes. Yeah. The, the real spending for them got cracking after that, right? That's like you right. bring Alice Rodriguez in. When they lost. In. Yes, Right. And then they only won one championship in the next nine years after they actually did all the spending while they I'm lost s- to the, 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 the Marlins in I'm 2003. Sorry, right. Like you can go up and down that. They them won doing one all World that Series sp- in the last 21 years. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Them doing <laughs> all that spending actually didn't have the effect that we're talking about. We've seen the Red Sox with all that spending actually come out and be terrible. Where they had that weird thing. It was like World Series, terrible. World Series. How the hell did that happen? Oh, well. Yeah. But you know what I mean? But that's let them do it if that's the game that they go wind up playing. No question. No question. And that, and that is the point. What is this got to do with me? If I'm the Texas Rangers, I'm spending whatever I'm going to be spending in my situation. If I'm the Los Angeles Dodgers, I'm going to be spending what I spend in my situation. What you're really doing is you're controlling the uncontrollables. You're controlling Ted Turner because Ted Turner is the guy who rise, you know, the rising tide raises all boats. Well, you know, Ted Turner paid a backup infielder eight million dollars now i gotta pay to back up eight you know that now that becomes the new floor you're you're trying to control the george steinbrenners you're trying to control all those guys and now those guys are gone and now you're trying to control the mark walters and guggenheim with the dodgers and you're trying to control the john henry's of the world but those guys don't spend the way the old guys did anyway i mean so okay you're gonna give trevor bauer you're gonna give mookie betsy you're gonna give max scherzer a, a ton of money sure but everybody else It hasn't really been rising all the boats lately, the last four or five years. That argument doesn't really work anymore. So salary caps and competitive balance taxes and luxury taxes, those things, they do not create parity. We are seeing more 100 loss teams, more losing squads than we have in the past. They're all, you know, I mean, now I remember putting out a poll one day asking this question amongst Houston Astros fans, pre-cheating, of course, and their argument was, I'll take four years of tanking for one World Series. It's worth it. It's the way to go. And I don't like that. But you know why they would do it? Because while that team was tanking, they just acted like they weren't there. That's right. Like, it wasn't like they were riding along with the misery. Houston is like, cool, holler back when y'all good. We'll, yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just let me know. I mean, they they had a dispute with the the, the, the RSN, the cable network, that was mm-hmm. making it weird. But there was a point where they were doing zero ratings on Astros games when that overlapped when they were terrible. Literal no. zeros. No, that's right. And all of these things, it's all anti-player. Let's just call it for what it is because it's anti-labor. I mean, this is, they're trying, you know, they're in a fight right now. And I think that one of the things that has been really difficult to watch is I think Rob Manfred is in the position that he's in. He's the first commissioner who was an ex-labor leader. And I think that when you get into that big chair, 
you have to transition. He hasn't transitioned. He's still a bulldog. And maybe you can't just become something else from what you are. But as a face of this, he's not looking like the game matters to him. And I know that's a hard thing to say, but you got to at least sell it. Bud Selig, no matter what Bud did, and Bud was as, as, as hardcore an owner as anybody else, Bud still gave you the impression he loved the game. You know, and that may feel somewhat revisionist, but every time you talk to Bud Selig about something, Bud, Howard, let me tell you a story about Henry Aaron, and he knew baseball. These guys, the, the, the Roger Goodells and the Gary Bettmans, and I don't know Adam Silver you know, that much, but they don't look like they care about this product at all. No, see, and that's actually interesting. I, Roger Goodell, I think, if nothing else, at the very least, loves the institution of football, right? A- but absolutely, I think, the institution of football, yeah. yes. But I also think football itself, like, what I pick up off of him from the draft is that he's in that case as a guy who, like, really admires and respects football players. Like, I do believe that he's that yeah. guy. And Adam Silver, much like David Stern, those are, like, dudes from the Northeast who love basketball, right? Like the very particular personality Mm -hmm. archetype. But I bet if you wanted to go in right now and talk to Adam Silver about basketball in the NBA, he could have a conversation with you about what's going on with the NBA. David Stern always found interesting when he rejected that trade and he finally came, you know, the Chris Paul trade. He was explaining it was a terrible trade. He could talk to you and explain why it is. Like he was a dude that could tell you about the seventh man on somebody's bench. Those guys love it. Bettman, you know, I don't really be kicking it over there, so I ain't got a handle on him. But Manfred... Manfred looks like he doesn't know who, like, the players are. Yep. And that's bad. I I talked to someone who knows Rob Manfred from way back, and Rob Manfred went to Cornell and studied labor relations, and the way that person described him was, it was a bunch of Marxists and a dude that was there to learn how to destroy unions. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And they sense that when you call your championship a piece of metal. That ain't just the comment you just, oh, man, I walk. you can't walk that back, right? You just told us who you are. That's like saying blacks don't have the buoyancy to be managers, right? I mean, that's but, what you remember. You but Manfred, I, I felt like he was trying to play it like, you know, the championship is a piece of metal, but the importance comes that I die. But the, once yeah. those words came out, nobody heard can't. nothing else from him. You cannot put the toothpaste back in the tube when you say that to these guys, especially when they don't like you in the first place especially when they don't trust you already. And and when people believe that you have been laughing at them, and when they look at the financials and say, you're also screwing us. So you've got a bad situation over there, no doubt. No doubt about it. And, and I feel like somewhere along the line, the point that you made earlier about 95 being the demarcating line and that there's no going back and we can never let that happen again, I think that it's the opposite now. I think that baseball looks at hockey and goes, well, they canceled the season twice. They look at basketball and say, they cut the season down 50%. Had a 50-game season and still crowned a champion. I think they are like, we can wait this out. It's happened before. Maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. And that the the country is so divided and has gotten so cynical and throws their hands up and rolls their eyes and goes on to do something else that we can hang in there and get what we want. Well, their bright side is they are the only American sports league that has a chunk of the calendar with no on-field competition for attention. Until the USFL comes back with a vengeance. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean, though? But, like, football, <laughs> true. football yeah, football's still running things, but there's pennant race baseball that's going on at the same time. Basketball and hockey come out here together at the same time. They run it through June. But between June and August, baseball's got it, right? There's yeah, the- nobody else really competing with them. And I wonder if they just feel like, look, if we just can get back out here and we out here by, you know, by late June, people ain't going to have nothing else to do, so they're going to come to us. Yeah, and I think that they may very well be underestimating as well, or not, the resolve of the fan. I mean, the fans always come back, and I think that's their attitude. Their attitude is is that they said we had destroyed the game in 95, but look at 98, right? They're, they're, they can make that argument, and it's not a bad argument. They're saying we're killing the sport, but our numbers are going up. Our revenues are bigger than ever. I mean, they can, by by those measures, they're not wrong. 
But I think that where the game is in the most trouble is how the sport is played. And also, let's not forget, and we had this conversation with Brian Flores and, and, and Steve Ross. You cannot sell tanking in a sport when you've gone all in on gambling. At some point, you're going to pay for that. I don't care how cynical you are, how many people are, are mimicking their fantasy teams and how many people have gambling problems. At some point, somewhere, you cannot lose on purpose when people think you're gambling, when people know you're gambling on the sport. You're going to lose everything. Our friends at CarMax have reimagined car buying to deliver a truly flexible shopping experience that puts you in control. Because at CarMax, you have the freedom to shop online and on the lot. Once you find the right car, you can buy online with home delivery in select markets or choose express pickup at your local CarMax. CarMax has you covered with a 30-day money-back guarantee up to 1,500 miles. Learn more at CarMax.com. CarMax, car buying reimagined. Did you see the story, by the way, tangentially related about the charter planes in the WNBA? Unbelievable story. Yo, and so here's what's interesting about that to me. If you haven't seen it, Sports Illustrated did a story about how Joe Tsai, who owns the Nets but also owns the New York Liberty, had provided a charter flight for his players. And that's an issue in the WNBA is about travel because you really can't turn around on a modern sports schedule as we think of it. Off the, just the schedule of commercial flights. Like, 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 forget about the inconvenience of it. Just the schedule of it, right? We get done playing at 10 o'clock. You can't get on a plane that night. You got to wait Which, and then get up at 6 o'clock in the morning because that's when flights run, right? But Cy pays 500, you know, his, his commercial flight is like $500,000 and it sends the whole WNBA into a tizzy, basically on a competitive imbalance, like an improper benefit sort of thing in excess of the salary cap. But there was a deal that had been made that would have allowed the WNBA for three years to have charter flights. And the old guard owners said no, because they're like, yo, what are we going to do after those three years? Meanwhile, there's a new crew of owners that are like, yo, we can get this thing popping and make some money off of this. Let's get, the, you know, let's run it like a real thing. And what got me about it was so interesting is, yo, these capitalists, it's so wild when they don't want it to be capitalism anymore. That's right. That's right. And, and it goes back to something else, which is how many times do we tell sports fans, they're not all us about winning. They're all these owners. Teams aren't trying. Very few teams are trying to win. Like number one priority is winning. No, it's not. Winning is a byproduct of things that happen if things go right. But what you're really trying to do is, is control costs and, and, you know, increase revenues. But what's so wild about it is these cats are so rich and already have so money that you would think that they would get in this just to have fun and just to try to win, right? You would, they, you would they, think. You'd think they'd act like boosters. Yeah, right? We're just going to throw this money around in order to make this happen. And they don't. Maybe we need to start kicking it like they do in Europe. They be over there trying to win in Europe. You know why? Because they be getting in the streets about this stuff, dog. Oh, that's right. They be out there. They, they Look, look. If the Lakers were like Manchester United, it would look like the Ukraine over there in <laughs> England. You know what I'm saying? Like if the Lakers was losing, man, please. They be in the streets. Yeah, and and this is also reading that story also struck me as trying you know trying too hard to be good. Now you're forcing me to be good. You got a charter. Now I got to come up with a charter. And this is how you treat you know if you treat your players that well. Now that's going to be the expectation. And expectations cost money. You're costing me money by doing this, Joe. Joe, what are you doing? You're messing up. I mean, it's no different than than George Steinbrenner and company starting to pay. You know, if you're going to pay this guy six million now, I got to pay him six million. But and you we're know supposed what's to be part of the that? same club. You know what's wild about that? That ain't never happened in my actual life. No. Just because they pay somebody else too much money ain't never made me a dime. But it's a closed business. For yep. those guys. I mean, it is a closed business. And at, and at some point, this is the talent pool. And that's why we watch these athletes. They're not like us. They don't, their economic structure is not ours because they are the best in the world at what they do. Clearly, and I'm no disrespect to you or to me, but somewhere, somehow, somebody could say, we could probably find somebody else to maybe do what you do. You can't find somebody else to do what Michael Jordan does. Yeah, I am talking about when they give like all the money to the Dobbs Bertons of the world. You know what I'm saying? It ain't oh, and never, the whole right, exactly. When the that's boat what I mean. All, like Mike, the is boat one has thing. never gone up. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I just seen bums get overpaid very often. I'm sure there's people that think that I was an overpaid bum, and guess what? It ain't do a damn thing for you, did it? Nope. Mm -hmm. I was just a bum who came up. 
That's right. That's right. Well, and it is it's going to be real interesting to see how the WNBA responds to this because they got exposed. They got exposed because there's let's not forget the idea that you're doing this because they're women and you don't care about them anyway. Yep. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Howard Bright. Check him out. Metal Arc Media. Check him out. At ESPN. Got a great column on the uh, baseball work stoppage. And I also, not to take shade away from him, but I think he'll agree with me on this. Check out what Jeff Passan wrote about this uh, about two days ago. He put out a thorough monster on this situation. It reads so much different than the New York Times, which always feels like is a subsidiary of Major League Baseball. But that is neither here nor there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this three times a week. Gabe Bassane and Adi Khan handling things behind the scenes. Thank you, gentlemen. And also, thank you for watching on YouTube. Uh, remember, follow The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. <laughs>